Great. Again, thanks everyone for joining. Um, for those of you who missed last week's lecture, um, please, uh, I think the recording is probably out by now, um, but uh, at any rate, if, if it's not, when it does come out, if you're interested in, in going back and taking a look at that, um, please feel free. And just to, to recap a little bit, last week we talked um, in a very kind of broad way about um, epidemic or pandemic preparedness and response and what are some of the important elements of that. And I covered, um, these were the take home points from that lecture. If you recall, those of you who heard that, that the zoonotic interface is really in viruses that come from the zoonotic interface that is between humans and animals is really the biggest threat for us. Um, the, the response, and we'll talk more about this today, of course, what's most important is really developing the capacity to respond in country in uh, really at that interface. And so com coming in from other places, flying in and flying out and providing technical expertise, it, not that it doesn't have um, utility, it, it is an important element of it, but really it's um, developing the capacity in the trenches, if you will, um, that is the, the most important. We are making some progress in different types of diagnostics. And so increasingly, figuring out what pathogen causes an outbreak or a pandemic is not our biggest challenge. Um, often our biggest challenge is that once we identify it, which we can do relatively rapidly, then uh, trying to control, of course, and learn more, especially about new pathogens. And then, as I mentioned last week, regardless of what your sort of general philosophy is, whether you say you're primarily concerned about infections and outbreaks in Europe or the UK or London or Kyoto or New York or wherever it may be in the world, um, increasing that capacity is in the best interest of everyone because of course we're all seeing in the COVID-19 outbreak is the obvious representation or example of that, that it's all connected. And so we, we can't say it's not really our problem what happens in one area of the world or why should we have to worry about what happens in Africa or Asia or North America, um, really we're all connected and we're seeing that. So this is really needs to be a global approach and a, and a global strategy for outbreak control. And then recognizing that it's not all about just biomedical innovation and epidemiology. Um, those are incredibly important in this whole process but we have to recognize that most outbreaks are disproportionately affecting the poorest populations in the world. That's certainly true when we have outbreaks such as Ebola that are relatively restricted to areas of sub-Saharan Africa, but it's even true if we look at um, the COVID-19 outbreak and or pandemic that although certainly spread throughout the world, if we look at the mort mortality and morbidity to that, it's still again um, disproportionately affecting the poorest populations of our planet. And so we need to recognize that it's not only about the biomedical part, but it's also about being proactive as an advocate for health as a human right and the social and recognizing the social and political determinants that are also extremely important and trying to correct those. So that's a, a brief recap of what we discussed last week. And then today, um, I'll try to cover in a very broad sense, you know, what do we do? How do we make our systems for outbreak control and preparedness more efficient? So first of all, just a, a very um, general principle, and I, I get asked this many times by different sources, you know, what's, what's something that I've learned over the years? And I now reminds me, I've forgotten Ayako to give a little bit of introduction um, of myself, but um, so maybe I'll, I'll stop briefly about that. Uh, uh, my, I'm a, a physician by training um, in internal medicine, infectious diseases, or the master's degree in public health and tropical medicine. As you may be able to tell from my accent, although I work um, uh, in, in the UK, I'm an, originally from the United States, um, have worked in many different places in the world, uh, got into this business of outbreak response, especially in the field of viral hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola and Marburg and Lhasa and those sorts of viruses, initially working with the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and then worked in various settings over the years in academia at um, Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine in New Orleans. I was at four years in, in Peru, a couple of years in El Salvador. Um, sometime in Geneva at WHO, um, and then uh, for the last four years or so, I've been privileged to lead, and what I'll talk more about today, 
um, something called the UK Public Health Rapid Support Team, which is co-led by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Public Health England. So that's an academic and government collaboration. And I'll, and I'll tell you more about that in just a minute. So that, that's my background. Um, and so moving on now, what do we do? What, how do we try to combat um, these situations? Certainly global situations or pandemics like COVID-19, but also increasingly we're seeing that more regional outbreaks still have global impact. And so um, the, certainly the, the recent, uh, the, over the last two years, outbreak of Ebola in uh, an Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, and definitely the uh, earlier outbreak of Ebola in the Western part of, uh, of Africa, in um, Guinea, Guinea and Sierra Leone and Liberia. You know, these were primarily local and regional problems, but nevertheless had a global impact in terms of imported cases and disrupting travel and trade um, and uh, panic and diverting our attention and resources. So um, these are really becoming increasingly frequent. And so we need to really figure out how to deal with these, not only on a, uh, on a global scale, but on a, on a local scale. And uh, an important thing, coming back to my original point for this slide, people ask me, you know, what's the most important? What have you learned over the years? And one of the things that I have learned in, in a lot of different outbreaks is that ultimately effective control for outbreaks is a local phenomenon. That does not mean that it does not need global and international leadership, but nevertheless, what really um, makes the difference is the, the local approach. And, and so I put that there, think globally, act locally. You've heard this slogan for lots of different things in politics and, and otherwise, but it's definitely true for, for public health. And so we really need to make sure that we are um, acting locally with local partners because ultimately, despite all of our um, support that we may bring from London or Geneva or Kyoto or wherever it may be, it's really the local partners that uh, and the local population that decide how they're going to adapt behavior to try to, or if they're going to adapt behavior to try to limit the transmission of a pathogen. And so if we don't really succeed in um, getting that local population as a partner that's buying into this, recognizing the problem in the way that we might recognize the, the, the problem with our external expertise, then we will ultimately fail. And if we look at outbreaks, I think, you know, um, although I do think our team and many others have contributed, ultimately it's the, the local population that um, gets a hold of these things. So that's extremely important. You may have seen these or read some of these sorts of books and seen the movies. Um, you know, if you see Dustin Hoffman, this is an older movie now, and uh, this movie Outbreak, and, and very often what's portrayed here is exactly the opposite of people flying in and flying out and kind of saving the day. And uh, that might make for a, a good movie, but it doesn't really make for the most important element of outbreak response. And so again, this isn't to say that international support is not important. I think it, it, it is. And, um, and that's what uh, the group that I'm privileged to lead, we provide support, not only for the, the response itself, but also for the um, also for capacity development, and I'll talk about that. But uh, at any rate, um, it's extremely important that, uh, that we get beyond these sort of more grandiose ideas of, okay, it's mostly about getting the helicopter and having the team that flies in and save the day. That's what maybe makes for a, a great movie, and, uh, but it, it doesn't really make for great outbreak control. So not the most important thing, flying in, parachuting in and, uh, and saving the day. And, and also um, the landscape in terms of, of, um, of outbreak response has changed rapidly. Um, I've found over the, the time that I've been engaged in this field for perhaps the last 25 years or so. And so if, if we look, um, especially focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa, if I go back, you know, some of the early outbreaks that I was involved in in Sub-Saharan Africa, there really was very, very little infrastructure for outbreak response. Not only the technical infrastructure in terms of labs and things like that, but also just really having a, an organized program. And there was a, an assumption, and through that assumption, a dependency on people coming in that, okay, WHO and, and Geneva from Geneva and USCDC from the United States from Atlanta and others would fly in and really kind of take over and, and run things. 
and that that did happen for a while. And I think even you know my, in my time for for CDC years ago, that really was our approach. And we didn't really think of it at the time as a colonial type of of attitude. We thought, and and I think even when we came in the expectation from our partners in Africa was often that, okay, we would sort of take over and run things because after all, when you looked at an outbreak of Ebola, for example, how many people have experience with Ebola? E even those of you who are in your training in Kyoto or elsewhere, and certainly when I did my training, it's not the sort of thing that we, we spend a lot of time on. Um, so there was that expectation and acceptance, but that has really changed over the the years. And so we've seen, um, first of all, we've seen the, the emerging economies and, and technical expertise uh, across Asia in particular, um, that really has much expertise that wasn't there if you looked at Southeast Asia um, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, that's also happening in Latin America. And this is reflected in, in uh, not only, of course, the technical expertise, but parallels um, the, the economic development of many countries across the world. Uh, but it's also happening, um, uh, uh, still a ways to go, but also happening in um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And so now this idea that people would kind of come in and take over or be the leads is really something that is not considered appropriate. And so when we go to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, appropriately, the, the Congolese say, this is our country, we're in charge, we welcome the support, but um, we're the ones who are going to be in charge and organize this response. And, uh, and so the national stakeholders are really demanding much greater control. And so that's a good thing. And that's um, what, something that, that we want to see. It's sometimes difficult for um, institutions and individuals who have been used to kind of coming in and, and uh, saying, this is what's going to happen to now be in a more supportive role rather than a leadership role. But I think that's, that's really the transition that we want to happen. There's sometimes um, a degree of mismatch, if you will, in terms of the desire for leadership, but the capacity to lead. And so in, in many, or not, not only to lead, but also the the technical capacity. And so still in, in many areas of Sub-Saharan Africa, there's an organization and a desire to be of national stakeholders to say, okay, this is our country and we're going to be in a, in a leadership position and co completely appropriate, but the capacity to implement is still often quite thin. And so that can be um, challenging because the, the groups that come in and say, okay, we do have the technical capacity in terms of helping with laboratory support and epidemiology and data analysis, um, they may have different ideas ideas of how to do things. And so we do have a period of some tension, often speaking, quite frankly, between that local leadership and then um, the international stakeholders. But I, I anticipate that that will resolve over time. And then of course, this is really what we want if we're sincere about capacity development. It has to be that we don't uh, take a leadership role coming in from London or Geneva or Atlanta or wherever it may be, that we really want um, that leadership role and that capacity development to um, come along with our partners. And so this, this concept of rapid deployments to kind of come in and fix things is really one that uh, is not acceptable in, uh, in any context these days. Again, not saying that the international support is not needed and welcomed, um, but it, it's still um, the, the leadership has to be on a local, national and regional level. And if we look at how that has been traditionally set up, we have, <clears throat> Um, and these are sort of the traditional guy, traditional architecture of this. So international coordinator, um, coordination has come from World Health Organization based in Geneva, actually, where I'm speaking to you from uh, today. And this is, this is uh, as you've seen with some of the outbreaks over the last, um, last decade or two, this has come into question and there's a lot of criticism and pressure on WHO, some of it perhaps justified, much of it not justified. And, uh, but we, we've seen with the West Africa outbreak of Ebola a few years ago, that there was lots of criticism that said uh, WHO was too fast to call that out, uh, to, to, or too slow, excuse me, to, to call that outbreak and to really react to it. You know, somewhat ironically and related, I think the 2009 H1N1 um, influenza pandemic that started in Mexico and then into the United States and then around the world 
Um, WHO was criticized because they were too fast to recognize that and say, okay, this um, pandemic has started. They were correct that the pandemic has started, but what no one could have known at the time, and we talked about it last week, is it turned out to be not a particularly um, virulent virus that was circulating. And so there was um, frustration that WHO had said this pandemic has started and, and we really need to be paying lots of attention to this and putting resources into control when ultimately, even though there were many, many cases, the case fatality was extremely low. And, and But this is an extremely difficult position for anybody to be in, no matter how much expertise you have. Of course, when you, you need to say and sound the alarm, okay, something is important and needs global attention and therefore global or regional or national resources, um, for a few things, it gets relatively easy. We never say, for example, that there's one case of Ebola, you know, we would never say, well, let's not worry about one case of Ebola, call us back when there's, you know, five or 10 or 100 cases of Ebola. Every case of Ebola is considered an outbreak, but for other things, it's much more difficult. And we have this challenge across the world for um, endemic diseases. And so if you look trying to figure out whether we're having just endemic spread, for example, of seasonal flu um, when we get into cold weather in temperate climates. And at one point do we say, well, this is the normal level of circulation. And now we have something that is, that is considerably significantly above normal that takes different resources and a different approach. And so very difficult to, to say when you cross the line, crossing the line by a little bit, relatively easy for Ebola in some ways, um, to say, okay, in one case is an outbreak, but other things it gets much more difficult. And we see this, those challenges um, in, in diseases that are endemic like uh, yellow fever and, and others where um, we know that there's going to be some degree of circulation and when um, they cross a certain line, you know, how, how far they are above that line to um, try to, to pull out other mechanisms of response. And so that's, um, that's a challenging thing. WHO has also, of course, been challenged by a lot of international criticism that you've seen recently. Um, we saw the, the United States um, up until recently, very recently, up until last week, uh, re re withdrawing support for WHO. We anticipate that the, the election that happened uh, and finally was called after days and days of uh, of people waiting to see how that was going to go. But um, um, the president-elect Biden has already stated that one of his, his first moves will be to restore funding for WHO. And this is not about really saying that WHO is doing a, a bad job or a good job. It's just a challenging job. Um, and then as we go down from, from uh, the headquarter level to Geneva, we have WHO regional offices. But we also have a lot of regional partners that have come up that are um, hopefully coordinating, but not formally within the, the WHO system. And so if we look, one of the partners um, with whom we work uh, quite a bit is the Africa Centers for Disease Control based in Addis Ababa and sponsored by the African Union um, with support from other entities from USCDC and Gates Foundation and, and quite a few others, Jack Ma in China. But um, this is a, an entity that's um, come online very recently, um, doing a fantastic job under John and Kangasong's leadership. And so we're really seeing some partners, but also some, some questions about, okay, if it's not all through the WHO system, how does it work out? If we do, we, is it the African regional office at WHO that handles the surveillance or is it Africa CDC that handles surveillance? To whom do we look really as the key partners um, and then, uh, and then uh, in what investments are made in those key partners and how is it coordinated between them. And I, and I think that can be done, but we're still seeing this changing, this evolving architecture and, and how that's going to work, I think. Um, the, the good news in that is that there are just some, some building blocks, I think some capacity that, uh, and things to work with. And sure, we need to figure out globally how it all fits together, but um, there, there is capacity and building blocks to put together. And then on that same, that same theme, the national coordination, we're, we're seeing um, there's a, a ways to go in many countries of the world. And, uh, but we're seeing especially some emerging national public health institutions um, like Nigeria CDC, for example, again, under really a very um, capable leadership of uh, Chikwe Ikweizu there. 
and really coming on strong and providing you know, expertise and local leadership and local capacity that we hadn't seen in a previous era. So there, there's much cause for optimism, really, if we look at these building blocks. It's not that every country has that degree of uh, an NPHI or National Public Health Institute, but um, the idea there, there are many that have strong NPHIs now are coming along and others that are working on it. And then, uh, and then also pr improving the capacity through Ministry of Health. So I think we're looking at a, a relatively optimistic um, scenario in that way. But we, we need to make sure that this flows really down, as I mentioned in the, my opening comments, onto a, a very local level. And so it really needs to get down to the local implementation and the community partners and, uh, and recognizing that even a national government may not necessarily be always the most um, obvious and welcome partner on a local level. So it can be challenging. We take that to a degree for granted in places, um, uh, I, I presume like Japan and the United States, although the United States was quite fractured as we've seen um, of the states that have not been united in their approach to, uh, to COVID-19 and, and uh, in so many areas of the world. That can be even more troublesome and problematic in areas, um, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, where within the, what were ultimately very artificially created boundaries from a colonial era, you have incredible ethnic and linguistic diversity within a country in many places. And so you can, uh, you can imagine the challenge when just on a, on a logistical, practical level, if um, you have 20 or 30 different languages that are spoken across the country and local health um, partners speak one language and people from national level speak a different language. You know, those can be um, very challenging. Um, we saw that and had a, a lot of challenges ironically when I used to work, uh, used to work leading loss of fever programs in West Africa and, and trying to coordinate between Guinea, which is Francophone and uh, neighboring Liberia and Sierra Leone, which are Anglophone. Um, and, uh, and for the most part, most of the people in my experience in Liberia and Sierra Leone did not speak French, and most of the people in Guinea did not speak English. And then there were many, many different local languages that would be um, challenging to try to work between. And so there's still a long ways to go to make sure that um, this pyramid that you see there in green, that it broadens out at the base, that we really have this translating all the way down to the base and not something that's top heavy coming from a Geneva or a London or Atlanta level or even an Addis Ababa or um, Brazzaville level where um, Afro is, is located, but really translates down to the capacity to um, respond and detect and detect and respond and prevent um, on a very local level. And so just, uh, I think I showed this slide last week, but um, some of the things that I see changing is just the, the, the real optimism of some very strong, capable leaders um, in different places in Africa. And these are just three, there, there are many more. And, and we could put up such slides about very capable leaders in, uh, in many other countries, in Singapore and Hong Kong and, uh, and Peru and across the world, um, that, that I think in a way, realistically, that we wouldn't have been able to, to put up um, you know, 20 years ago in terms of technical capacity, but also just the sophistication and understanding the, the big picture landscape uh, of, uh, of public health. And this has come through, um, in many ways, through what I would call the the magic formula, but not the formula that we want to rely on. And so if you look at these leaders, um, they are all born and grew up in sub-Saharan Africa, but then came to um, the global north to train. Chikwe Kwezu was, uh, was at Public Health England for, I think, maybe 10 years or so. John and Kengasong at USCDC, both in Atlanta, and led the USCDC program in Cote d'Ivoire for many years. Um, Shidi Moeti came and studied at the London School, actually at least two of these three have studied at the London School, and, um, and, and many others. And so you, really what you get is that combination of people who have, you know, come and get the technical know-how and, and, uh, and learn. And it's not only about the science, it's also about learning how the resources come into systems and how you um, develop hypotheses and implement programs and publish papers and then use that to get more resources that come and support the work that you need to do. And then having gotten that experience and then you go back to Sub-Saharan Africa, in this case, 
um, with speaking the local language and understanding the local customs and how to how to uh, navigate the political waters, you know that really um, makes for very very strong leadership. But we can't depend on that, and because of course the it's it's not really possible for um, creating that leadership pool with everyone coming to London or United States or, or Japan or wherever it may be. So that's certainly welcomed, but I think one of the things that we need to focus on is making sure that we are supporting the academic institutions in country and low and middle income countries and so that people with this expertise and know-how don't need to come away from or move away from Abuja or from from Cameroon, where John and Kinga Song is from, or, or wherever it may be, in order to get that sort of training and experience, and so that we have a rich pool of local leaders and through local training, and so that's one of the one of the challenges still um, to be to be uh, fronted, I think, in uh, in a global sense. So if we look at the systems, how they work, um, you know, this is uh, the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, or GORN, that is closely affiliated with WHO, and this has functioned since 2000. Um, it's having its 20-year anniversary right now, and, uh, and this has been an important element of putting expertise into the field. Um, I've been working with Gorn for many years and sit on the steering committee, and so I think Gorn is doing great work, but it's also uh, Gorn and WHO, again, needing to look at um, the, the model and perhaps rejuvenating um, the, the idea of building the base rather than being too um, dependent on, uh, on support that comes from outside experts. And, um, and we've seen that, incidentally, with COVID-19, because uh, especially with all the, the fractured supply chain and fractured travel system, um, it has been incredibly difficult to get um, international expertise to the places where they need to be. And so fortunately, we've seen that, uh, again, using the example of Sub-Saharan Africa, but we could talk about many places in Southeast Asia or elsewhere, you know, those, those countries have developed and stepped up in, in order to be less dependent, if you will, on some of the, uh, the outside support. And so things are happening. And, uh, and, I'll, and I'll give a, an example now and how we're approaching this in the UK. So the rest of my talk will be on uh, the UK public health rapid support team. And as I mentioned in my initial introduction, this is the team that I'm fortunate to be able to, to lead in the UK. And um, first of all, this is a, a relatively new entity. It came in the, in the wake of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And you'll note that uh, we intentionally call this the rapid support team rather than the rapid response team. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, the terminology that you usually see is rapid response team. And the reason that we went away from that terminology is because, again, it seemed a little bit like we were flying in and flying out and saving the day. And we wanted to get away from that. And we wanted to underscore that what we're here to do is really to support local partners, um, local, national, and, and regional partners in terms of preventing and responding to outbreaks. We are, um, we think, an important part of that process, but nevertheless, um, we don't fly in and save the day. We're here to support others. And this came out of um, the, uh, the West Africa outbreak. So during that outbreak, I was um, part of the time still based in Peru, actually, where I led a laboratory in Lima, Peru, but um, deploying very often to um, West Africa for this. And then also um, midway through the outbreak actually switched and, and then was based at WHO. And, uh, but we saw that in West Africa with the Ebola outbreak, almost 30,000 cases, we covered this a little bit in last week's lecture. So go back and look at that if you'd like. But we saw um, really many of the shortcomings and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't just about responding to the outbreak, but it was recognizing that there were other things that we need to do in outbreak settings that are extremely important that we were not uh, really set up to do, at least with the, the rapid approach that we needed. And so uh, there was a health crisis for response, but it was a health crisis where in, in many settings, the only way to learn about um, about emerging diseases is during the outbreak. And so if we have, for example, a therapeutic or a vaccine for Ebola, we can't plan a study and say like we might be able to do for more common endemic diseases 
Um, we can't plan a study and say, okay, over the next two years in this particular place where there's good infrastructure and, and a team to uh, implement a study at this university or wherever it may be, and we're going to test and see if this Ebola vaccine works or this Ebola treatment works. Obviously, we can only do that in many of these settings when there is an outbreak of considerable size. And so that puts, it's really a challenging endeavor for us where we need to um, not only respond to the outbreak, but also be able to put in place the, the research that needs to be done quite rapidly. And if you look, for example, at vaccine research, you know, we, we usually consider, and prior to this outbreak, would consider that developing a product and getting a vaccine through to commercial market and availability is something, is a, a multi-decade process probably, and, and millions and millions of dollars and, uh, and we learned here that we needed to have um, the capacity to do that much more rapidly. And so when we conceived of the, uh, the UK Public Health Rapid Support Team, or what we call for short the RST, we recognized that it wasn't just about the response, but these other elements of it were extremely important, that it had to have a research component, and it needed um, really kind of the, the broader approach that uh, a government-funded entity may bring in terms of practical outbreak res uh, response, but it also needed um, really an academic approach. And so recognizing that um, the way this was put together was a partnership of Public Health England. Public Health England is a, a government agency <clears throat> and then the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. We also have involved um, various academic partners, University of Oxford and King's College, to name two. There, there are others that are engaged these days as this has moved forward. And this is funded by um, the UK government. It's funded through something that we call official development assistance. And the reason that I point that out is official development assistance is specific to low and middle income countries. And so we are not the group that responds um, primarily to what's happening in the UK when there's an outbreak or in Europe, we're the group that responds and really in low and middle income countries. And um, with funding for um, five years to start with, uh, and you can see there the funding is uh, due to run out in 2021. So in March, although we were up for refunding where I don't think we will get cut. So we'll have to see it in this extremely challenging environment of COVID-19 and the economic challenges, as well as the Brexit challenges in the UK, how that works. I, I think um, I'm not particularly worried. I'm not sure exactly how that's gonna go, but uh, we're still waiting for the government to work through all those challenges. But nevertheless, I think in uh, being the primary entity of the UK for responding to outbreaks in the middle of a pandemic, I don't think we probably will get, um, get cut. So we'll see how that works as we go forward. And recognizing the challenges that I already discussed in West Africa, we have not only a, a mandate for response, but a, a mandate for research and capacity development. And so we try to put these things together as much as possible. So um, important to respond to the outbreak in the way that I like to describe it to a group that um, is you know, that you're, you're a very sophisticated group of listeners, but for those who are less sophisticated, if, if the response to an outbreak is um, putting out the fire, then we like to and try to ask the question, well, what allowed this fire to start? What were the knowledge gaps that allowed this fire to start? And how can we work with local partners to put together the research and understand and fill those knowledge gaps? And then of course, the capacity development is helping those partners with the capacity so that the fire doesn't restart. And so we work on all three aspects of this. It's a challenging endeavor. We, we need more resources, human resources to do it. If I were to say to some of my colleagues, for example, at US CDC and other places and say, well, we work on both the response, the, the uh, research and the, the capacity building. Um, they might say, so what's the size of your staff, you know, 300 or 400 and, and rather the size of our staff is around 35. And so um, we, we have an incredibly dedicated staff and you can see here that uh, the different skill sets in terms of epidemiologists, laboratory microbiologists, social scientists, clinical researchers, um, infection prevention and control, data science, field lo logistics, training, and many other things that come along with this. And uh, I should mention that we are not the primary group for just clinical support. And so there, there's something called the UK Emergency Medical Team. And so if you need a group of doctors that will come and 
set to bones that are broken because of an earthquake or something like that. That's a different entity. We, we coordinate with them very closely and we often um, deploy with them if there's need for both their clinical support and our broader public health support. Um, we have, in addition to the, the people that I mentioned of our full team of 35, and, and that 35 includes um, quite a few, not all of them are what we call our core deployable team. Um, many of them are also, as you can imagine, there takes a considerable administrative and support staff and, and uh, operations staff to really put these people into the field and make sure that they have the support and, and working with our local partners. In addition to our, our core team, we have um, we rely on our, the field epidemiology training program in the UK and also have a reservist cadre. And so these are people that we can pull in. It's not their full-time job to work with us, but they get pulled in um, for various reasons. First of all, of course, surge capacity when we, when we need more people for an outbreak that's particularly large or complicated. And then for um, particular expertise that uh, we may not need all the time, but um, for example, um, expertise in arthropod-borne viruses. Most of the outbreaks to which we've responded to in, in our brief history have not been arthropod-borne viruses, but of course we've seen historically things like Zika and dengue can call for international support, and so you need that expertise. And so the, this, uh, the reservists can bring that expertise that we don't have full-time. These are um, people who are all trained and pre-accredited to rapidly deploy and, uh, and it allows us to engage really the broad capacity um, across the UK in academia and the private sector. And so we work out with them a whole system to be able to call on them when we need them. I, I should note, and, and often I'll get people who say, oh, I want to join that team so you can call on me when, when I'm, you know, when you have something, but it's not quite that simple. There, there really is quite an investment that we make in uh, the people for our team and they need to make. And so um, it's not sort of just sending, you know, paying for someone's travel to put them uh, into the field somewhere. There's considerable specialist training and pre-deployment training and safety training. You know, much of this is online, but also we put everyone through a five-day field course, um, safe and safe plus training done in the UK. It's, it's, this is not training to deal with, you know, epidemiology. It's the settings, unfortunately, where we often work, where there are considerable safety issues and what happens if someone gets taken hostage or if you are uh, driving somewhere and gunmen come out and stop your vehicle and, you know, how do you deal with these sorts of situations? And I'd like to say that that um, has never happened to myself or our team, but uh, in fact, it, it has happened. And so we've had um, in various places over the years, you know, things do happen. And I think, I think I um, covered this a little bit last week and told a, a few a few stories of some intense moments. So it does require someone who's ready to work in these sorts of environments and understand also the local and international architecture of, of working there. We don't go in as independent entities, we go in as part of a team. And, and then, then there's considerable elements of medical clearance. And so since all this has to happen relatively rapidly, um, all this needs to be done in advance. And so any, everyone who works for our team who is deployable needs to have medical clearance. That means they need to have appointments to make sure that they don't have any medical problems that would preclude them or prevent them from deploying, have all their vaccines up to date. We're ready to give them malaria um, prophylaxis if needed, depending on the country that they go to. And so it's a considerable investment to put this together. It's not something where you just say, okay, I'm, you know, and I, and I do get these and I appreciate the, the spirit, but I'll have, you know, people who write me and say, I hear there's an outbreak here. Can you send me to this place or that place? And, and the answer is no, because it really takes considerable um, effort and investment to have people ready to go. And this is just an example of the, the sorts of training that people go through. Um, these are not military doctors or anything, but nevertheless, they, they go through this training and learning how to, uh, how to deal with these sorts of settings. And um, again, I would like to say that, you know, our teams in the field have never had to put on helmets and flak jackets, but uh, unfortunately, especially for the Ebola outbreak in Eastern DRC, and I talked about this last week, that's not true. And they have had to put on helmets and flak jackets and, and uh, assure their protection. So um, this sort of training is extremely important. How do we deploy? Um, and I get this question a lot of, you know, do we, uh, how do we decide where we go? 
And really the easy answer is you can only go in the world where someone invites you to go. It's, um, you know, it's like if someone says, where do you, where do you have dinner? Uh, wh which friend's house do you have dinner? You have dinner at the friend that invites you over for dinner. And if they don't invite you over for dinner, yeah, it's, it's not an option really, even if you think it should be. So even if we think, okay, the, the outbreak of whatever disease it may be in a, in a given country um, really is getting out of control and, and needs support. And we sh think we have support that we can offer. Um, each nation is sovereign. And, and so, of course, really, unless they recognize that need and say, we would like um, you to, to provide support, it's not possible for us to come in. We can ask, we can uh, contact people through diplomatic channels and say, just so you know, we have support that is available if you would like. And then sometimes the support will come through a bilateral request. So, for example, um, we've uh, supported Nigeria CDC for loss of fever outbreaks on numerous occasions when um, Chikwe Ikwezu, Ikwezu from, that I mentioned earlier from Nigeria CDC has, you know, basically calls me up and say we need support and, uh, and how can we work that out and, and so we put that together and provide that support. The support or the request can al also come through WHO or GORN, as I mentioned earlier. So a country rather than coming directly to us can go to GORN and WHO and say, we, we need support for a given event. And so we need epidemiologists or laboratory scientists or whatever it may be. And can you put out a call for support? And so then GORN will do that putting out a call to GORN partners um, who can uh, can help out. And we often respond to that um, through GORN and, and then deploy um, through them and with WHO. And, uh, and then often, um, or on occasion, I mentioned UK emergency medical teams. And so when those teams deploy, we also can deploy to provide epi or laboratory or logistic or IPC support with them. So it really just depends. And the, the, the importance, I think, is first of all, having a team that is well-trained, well-prepared, and ready to go um, very rapidly. It's not a job that if, you, if you're someone who doesn't like to you know, have changes in your life, it's not a job to have because all the, the contracts for everyone on our team stipulates that they need to be ready to deploy within 48 hours notice. That doesn't mean that they don't get leave where they're off, but if they're not off, if they're on, then we say, okay, this is happening, so they need to be able to respond appropriately. And they do spend um, many, um, across a, a given year, many weeks and months um, traveling and internationally. Uh, COVID-19 has limited that some. It's not only the, the international time spent, of course, for the outbreak response, but this is also the, the team that is working in various um, various research and capacity development projects overseas. And so you might be in Nigeria working with Nigeria CDC for a month on a, on a research project that we do in collaboration with them and then come home and be home for a few weeks and then say, okay, now there's an outbreak of cholera and um, Ethiopia for which we've had a request and, and try to put teams back in the field. So it's a, it's a challenging and rewarding job. I think we have an incredibly dedicated team um, and th this is just an example. It needs to be updated. I think there's a few more, but you can get an idea over the course of our little over four years of existence so far, the places where we have deployed in some countries more than once and, uh, and the sorts of things we've deployed for. So um, cholera or acute watery diarrhea in Ethiopia, COVID-19 in quite a, quite a few different countries. Um, Ebola in the DRC, very engaged in the Ebola outbreaks in DRC over the, the last some two or three years, really, both in terms of um, the outbreak response and also research. Um, one, one example, I'm the co-PI on the study of the J&J &J Ebola vaccine that we've been doing in Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo for the last few years. So a lot, a lot of things going on that you can get an idea here. I think some some of the places that are not yet colored in on this map. We have teams in the Gambia right now, um, also a team, a small team, or at least one person in Bangladesh um, working on a seroepidemiology study for COVID-19 in Cox Bazar with the, in the area where the displaced Rohingya population that came from Myanmar. So th those sorts of things. So this is just an example of one of our deployments, um, a little bit of an unusual one here, where we were requested from the government to Sierra Leone to deploy a few years ago after there were very 
heavy rains um, that uh, created landslides and large numbers of internally displaced people. You can see on the, the lower slide there that ruined house and all that area that is all dirt and water previously was all inhabited in, in homes. And so a, a whole big section of a, of a degraded hillside basically came down with these heavy rains. And so we had large populations, internally displaced people and, and unhygienic settings. And so the recognition that waterborne diseases um, like cholera and, uh, and dengue, um, this was a, a very vulnerable population. And so our team was requested and, and went in to help shore up the epidemiology and the surveillance for um, waterborne diseases and also the laboratory diagnostics. I don't claim that it was because of our work, but we were whether we did a good job or whether we were fortunate, there were no outbreaks of cholera or typhoid. I mean, there were, there were isolated cases of many diseases, but there were no large outbreaks in the population. So just one example, this was a little bit more preemptive than response to a given pathogen. Um, I, I won't have time to go over all the details of our research or capacity development program, but um, so our research program is around five main themes that you can see here. And um, although this is by no means exhaustive or completely uh, limiting, so we have things outside the, these, uh, these elements as well. Um, and then <clears throat> we have probably um, somewhere over 25, I think it's probably close to 30 different research protocols that have been implemented over the four years so far probably five or six ongoing research programs right now and, and others that um, have come to completion are either published or reports out there or are still um, those reports and publications are still in process. Um, so a very active and diverse research program. And then getting to the capacity development side of things, and I think I may have mentioned this last week, but I uh, I like to quote James Bryce, a British statesman, who said, medicine was the only profession that labors incessantly to destroy the reason for its existence. And this is really our ultimate philosophy in the work that we do. And so that what we, not necessarily medicine, but the, we, we want to work so that years from now, people would say, why would anyone in Nigeria or the Congo or Bangladesh or wherever it may be, need anyone to come from London or Geneva or Atlanta? Why don't, you know, they have the capacity to do it themselves. And so we initially go through a period where um, outbreaks are detected very early and the response is organized and the technical expertise and logistics are in place. And so there really is not much need for that coming from London or, or elsewhere. And ultimately um, translating that to health system strengthening so that our outbreaks don't occur at all, of course. And this is very idealistic, but I think it's really what we need to work towards. And, uh, and ultimately, I, I'm not worried about being out of a job anytime soon. I think this is not something that will happen right away, but nevertheless, you know, this really has to be what all of us um, work for. And I'll give just an example of kind of the, the tripartite remit of our team and some of our work um, regarding a disease called loss of fever. If you're less familiar with this, this is a disease that is endemic in West Africa, um, first discovered in 1969 in Nigeria, and then uh, seen in quite a few countries with um, sometimes endemic but epidemic spread in, uh, especially in Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Liberia, um, various places. It's a rodent-borne virus that is spread by a common rodent, rodent commonly called the multimamate rat. The scientific or species name is Mastomys natalensis. And so we see this across West Africa and a, and a disease that I've worked in for a long time. Um, even prior to my present job as the director of the RST. But if you look at kind of our activities with this over um, the last few years, so we've been involved in outbreak response. And as I mentioned, um, providing different types of support for Nigeria CDC at their requests in two very busy lots of seasons and really where there was uh, endemic that was leading towards epidemic spread in, uh, in Nigeria over the last few years. This is a seasonal disease and you, you see much more of it typically in the dry season. And so we supplied, uh, provided epi epidemiologic laboratory, logistical and other support for um, fighting the, the epidemic, but also very engaged in research. And so we have projects on the clinical evolution and the pathogenesis of, of loss of fever, which are, is not well understood. There's a drug called ribavirin really in the 
whether that drug is really working well in the pharmacone pharmacokinetics of that drug are again, not well understood. And we have studies looking at that on the epi and lab side, um, developing a, an assay. There are not good assays for this. And so um, developing a, an IgG oral fluid assay that would allow us to better understand the epidemiology and the distribution of disease. Um, testing of loss of negative samples and, and all sorts of outbreaks. Um, one of the things that happens is uh, it's relatively easy to fit the case definition for Lhasa or Ebola or things like that. So if you put a, a case definition that you want to be very sensitive to um, identify all the possible cases. So it may be fever, headache, nausea, and vomiting. And if you're listening and say, well, fever, headache, nausea, and vomiting, I've had all those things in the past. If I had loss of fever, if I had Ebola, and of course, probably not, but in these settings, um, some people will have those things, but many people will have, uh, of course, not the target disease um, during the outbreak. And so understanding better, what are the other things that are happening and how do we how do we ensure that uh, the, the person who has dengue fever dur during an outbreak of Lhasa fever or during an outbreak of Ebola is also getting diagnosed and the care that they need. We've worked very um, diligently on many of the social science aspects uh, of uh, Lhasa fever and looking at healthcare seeking behavior for febrile illness in Sierra Leone, for example. Um, we've seen that uh, in recent years, there have been in the what was considered the epidemic area for, uh, for loss of transmission. We've seen very few cases in recent years, and we think that may have been um, related to the large Ebola outbreak that happened there that really was a, a miserable, difficult situation where there was a lot of nosocomial transmission and transmission in the hospital. And that may have scared people off of coming from the to the hospital when they have now loss of fever. Um, even though, of course, uh, the, the Ebola outbreak is over. So looking at healthcare seeking behavior and then capacity building, development uh, of a clinical research capacity at a place in, in uh, Eastern Sierra Leone. This has been a little bit challenging to continue on with because as I mentioned, in order to do that clinical research, you need people presenting to the hospital and we, with loss of fever and, and that has not happened very um, commonly lately. So uh, a challenge there to continue that, but we're doing our best. And then um, providing a lot of technical insights to a group that you may be familiar with, Coalition for Epidemic, actually is missed, um, mistermed there. It should be Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, or CEPI, um, a group that, uh, that we work with that is leading many vaccination efforts, including um, vaccination efforts for COVID-19, but also for LASA. And uh, it's not just about developing the vaccines, it's also about understanding how you use the vaccines, what's the target population. Um, and, uh, and so we're working a lot to provide the epi data and, uh, and working with CEPI, both um, on the level of uh, a high level in terms of on technical advisory committees, but also with projects on the ground in Nigeria and Liberia. So you can see there, although we have, there's much work to be done, um, we're doing our best there to cut across really the response, the research and the capacity building. And that's really how we, how we view um, the, the, the value of our team. This is just, we didn't create the center. This was created actually through previous projects that myself and many others have worked on over the years, but this is a new loss of fever ward in um, Kenema Government Hospital in Eastern Sierra Leone, which we think has great potential for a clinical research center for not only Lhasa, but other diseases. And um, I just thought I would give a, a few words here as we wrap up about our work on uh, COVID-19. This slide needs to be updated, but, um, but nevertheless, you can get an idea. So our team has been very active on COVID-19. Like everyone in the world, um, our travel has been relatively limited. So many deployments that used to be in person are now um, done remotely. Although we, we are seeing in, in recent months, we've still have been managed to deploy um, individuals to Bangladesh and the Gambia and Tajikistan and a few other places. But uh, so we're learning that um, what can be done remotely and extremely important. And uh, I think what we'll be seeing in the future is more of a, a hybrid level support that um, it, it's important, of course, to, to develop that remote capacity because no matter what, no group, certainly not ours, but no group really has the capacity to deploy rapidly someone to every corner of the world. And so, so um, having that remote support and things we're seeing you know, so much material that can be available online and, and automatically instantly available for 
people that need it. And, um, and of course, the internet connection is developing across the world. And so very few places that are, the connection may not be the most stable, but very few places that are completely disconnected right now. And, and so we're seeing both the promise and the limitations of that remote support. And I think we'll, going forward, when, when we all hope that the world I won't say normalizes because I think we're a long way away from going back to a previous normal, if you will. And I'm not sure we want to go back exactly to that normal for many reasons. But when it stabilizes, at least, I think we, we need to be looking at drawing out the best of both the remote and in-person support. Um, other activities, just to mention a few of our team, we put together a, a massive open online course or MOOC on COVID-19 that uh, was through the London School, had over 200,000 registrants for the course. And we, um, that the initial version was in English, but that was ultimately translated to, I think, five or six different languages, uh, French, Spanish, Portuguese, um, can't remember, Chinese, and, and, a, and a few others. Um, and then uh, have been working in, in various research, research projects with uh, a lot of different collaborators with Africa CDC and others. So lots of things going on, really. Um, I, I think I showed this slide last week. If we look at the future of um, the RST and the future of outbreak response, you know, one of the one of the challenges that we still have, again, is that the, the biomedical, social, and political determinants, we can't look at these as separate entities. Um, they are all intertwined and we need to be collectively active. I mean, we're all here working in the health sciences. And so we would think that the, the biomedical part of that is, is uh, where our expertise is and our component. And, and I agree that it, it of course is, but nevertheless, um, if we ignore the social and, and political elements of that, then we are um, really are not going to, to get to the bottom of things. And, and if you looked back at the slide where I mentioned our various deployments, you can see that quite a few of those diseases for which we deployed and offered support um, were vaccine preventable illnesses. And so that really is an example that it's not all about the technology. We have the tools really to prevent um, those diseases. They've just not trickled down to the, the people um, that are most in need. And so where do we see um, after the, the first four and going on five years of the RST, where do we, we want to go with this program? Um, we envision expanding our expertise and breadth across the UK, but also especially overseas with partners. And I've just named a few here, Nigeria CDC and Africa CDC. And increasingly, um, that uh, we will draw in resources, technical expertise for the UK, but nevertheless, the nature of our response will be shaped um, in conjunction with those partners in uh, low and middle income countries. And so it's not so much about what research project we decide to do, it's identifying, and I'm not saying we don't do this already, but even, even more, I think, identifying what do people in Nigeria CDC or Africa CDC or ministries of health in, in different countries, where do they say these are the important gaps in knowledge that we need to approach and how can you assist us and how can we do that together? And then diminishing the, the siloing of outbreak response. Um, I put up that slide about cholera in Yemen and there's really traditionally been somewhat of a, a siloing if you, if what I mean by that is a, 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 a parallel approach. And so you have humanitarian organizations that come in and respond and kind of provide care. And then you have technical organizations that provide outbreak response. And we don't always have an integrated approach to that. And so that's, that's very challenging in many ways. It's challenging because of course, it doesn't work very well when we go, understandably, we go to North Kivu where the Ebola outbreak um, persisted for a few years. And we say, here's the way that you need to change your behavior. And here are the things that you need to do to protect yourself from Ebola. And people who have never heard of Ebola are asking, well, what about the support for malaria and typhoid fever and all the things that my family and I have been suffering from over the years? And, uh, and so, not because we're doing it on purpose or because we're not feeling people, but you know what it amounts to at times is that we're walking by the child dying of malaria to find the child dying of Ebola. And ethically, of course, that doesn't sound like it's the right thing to be doing, but also strategically, it's not the right thing to be doing. Because again, coming back to that need for local partnership and local, local buy-in, unless, um, uh, the, the, unless a, 
a mother or father is convinced that you are there really to help their child, whatever that child may have. And, and it's not easy, of course, and we can't do everything, but unless we have an approach that is strategically looking at um, broadly all the things that, are, that people are, are suffering from rather than one particular disease that may not be the, the one that they recognize as the biggest challenge in their community, then strategically we will have a difficult battle. Um, just a few last slides. One of the things that uh, from the London School, putting on my, my London School hat that we are working on is creating a new center for epidemic preparedness and response. The, the, uh, the point of this is not to, to develop new teams to fly into the field or anything, but really to understand, and we've seen this for the uh, for COVID-19, that of course we need, we need epidemiologists and physicians and data scientists, but we're understanding that we really need to have a very coordinated response that includes certainly social scientists, but, but also health economists and political scientists. And, and if we've seen anything from the COVID-19 um, challenge, we've seen that a very fractured response where one group may be taking into account the, the more classic elements of transmission of a pathogen, but not taking into account the, epi, uh, the economic or mental health impacts of, of a given uh, mitigation measure, then we really don't solve the problem. And, and so we really need to work together. And so this is an entity to kind of have cross-cutting support um, across many different disciplines that we're fortunate to have at the London School, but also um, with many partners around the world. We really view the London School these days as kind of a, a, a global hub, but for an international operation and international activities. And in fact, more people um, who work for the London School who are not based in London than are based in London these days. And so I think that's really what we need to foresee both for this center, but also for um, the global architecture of outbreak response. So um, I'll end with the same sort of uh, advertisements that I put up uh, last time. Certainly welcome you to our annual meeting. Um, normally this would be in person in Toronto, but uh, the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, uh, I'm, I'm biased because I play different roles as the, uh, the scientific program chair and actually the president elect of this society, but um, a great place to really learn about tropical medicine and outbreak response and really the expertise is incredibly rich here. So please join us for that. Um, one of the advantages, if you will, of not having an in-person meeting is it's all available online and um, with registration is all recorded as well. So you don't have to watch it or participate in it all at once if you don't have time. Um, I mentioned a, a small, much smaller operation uh, and uh, Doctors for Global Health, an NGO that works on health and human rights that I would encourage you to check out. Um, this is something that I was privileged to start years ago with various colleagues. And then if you're interested in more on the rapid support team, um, a, a few places, you know, you can check out our websites. We do have an interest group and journal club that meets periodically, um, including meeting, meeting now remotely. And so you don't have to be in London um, to, uh, to be on this listserv and, and uh, participate with us. So feel free to email William Nicholas at that email address if you'd like to be on that listserv and keep up with our activities. So I think that's my last slide. Um, uh, yeah, some supplementary reading there if you're interested. Same slide from last week. And happy um, IACO to answer any questions. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Professor Bao. Such a wonderful lecture that we have learned so much and uh, the difficulty and challenges of uh, deploying uh, exports in a developing country in time of uh, uh, rapidly needing the support in for uh, uh, preventing uh, infectious disease. So now, uh, any question from the participants? Hello, hi there. Hello. Hello. I, I just want to say thank you very much, Professor. That was a really interesting talk and thank you so much to Kyoto University for hosting the event. Um, I am currently a student at LSHTM. I'm doing the MSc Control of Infectious Diseases. And uh, I'm very interested in your work, Professor, and I wondered whether you ever host summer projects for MSc students um, and whether that would be something I could email you about. Indeed, we do, and please do email me. I, I won't say we have a, a list all worked out, and so it's a process and um, perhaps even a more challenging process right now for, you know, obviously we all recognize that COVID-19 is 
is making things uh, more challenging. But uh, I certainly um, encourage student engagement with us and happy to explore that with you. So yeah, why, why don't you send me an email and we'll see what we can, uh, we'll, we'll set up a time to discuss. Fantastic, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, another question? Hi, thank you so much for such an interesting presentation. Um, I'm wondering, as uh, we move forward with capacity building in low and middle income countries, how do you see the role of WHO and other um, large international organizations changing? Yeah, I think that's the, that's the big question. Th thanks for um, offering that. And I think, you know, if you've if you paid attention to this, you've seen just a, a very challenging time for WHO, especially in the last, I don't know, five or 10 years. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that um, WHO was criticized for um, acting too rapidly for H1N1 in 2009, criticized for acting too slowly for Ebola in 2013 and 14. Uh, I'm not a person really who, you know, I don't have a knee-jerk reaction to defend nor criticize WHO. I worked at WHO for, for three years um, here in Geneva and also have, have uh, you know, still work on various committees and have collaborated with WHO for, for many years. I, I think that we do need to, WHO and others, really rejuvenate our efforts to um, make sure that the, the support that we're providing is really coming from a, a local and regional level. And, and like I said, there are local and regional um, and national building blocks to work with, I think, that were not as developed in, in a previous era. So, and it, and it does take a little bit of, um, you know, it's challenging to people because it takes giving up a little bit of control, right? And, and saying, well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be at the center of this and uh, someone else is going to be at the center of it. And, and um, so I think that's a little bit challenging for all of us. If, uh, if we don't do that, what we will see is that um, international organizations will ultimately get left behind. Um, because I, I think that we're seeing that uh, that the expectation is there that there will be a national and, and regional approach to this, and that they will the leadership will be from the, those areas. There are also um, funding as part of this, and so you know if you if you don't have a, a global approach, and we see this from London School or anywhere else, if you if you're not really um, contributing on a global level and contributing to that capacity development, people start asking the question, well, why would I you know, provide resources to London School or to the rapid support team? Why don't I just give resources to Nigeria CDC or to, to Africa CDC? And that, that may eventually be the right thing to do. But um, right now, I think even colleagues at Africa CDC and Nigeria CDC as examples that I use would say, yeah, we, we want the support, we want the engagement. And, and we, I don't think we need to be afraid of that, you know, overall so we, we see although there's i'll say a healthy competition you know we, we don't say well there's already a university in the uk right so we don't need another university or there's already people who do research so we don't need other people who do research i think there's you know a global need and and, and global efforts but we do need to we do need to i think from the who level um we need to push that out and really rejuvenate our efforts to, to have that local um, sponsorship and local engagement. And, uh, and we're also seeing how it's not only about WHO, but it's about many other elements of the biomedical infrastructure and response system. So I mentioned this, I think, last week. I don't think the, the London School people were... We, we had a glitch in the communications and I, I don't think anyone at London School knew about this last week. You can go back and find the recording. But if we look, for example, at local production of 52 countries in sub-Saharan Africa and local production of, uh, of vaccines, there are two, perhaps three, but very, very few countries in all of those 52 that actually themselves produce vaccines. So South Africa produces vaccines. Um, Senegal produces vaccines and a very small supply traditionally of yellow fever vaccine that really came out of historically the Institut Pasteur de Dakar in, in Senegal. And um, so, you know, if we look at really, it's not only about kind of providing the, the personnel, and but it's also really those other um, things that are extremely important. And so John and Kangasong and others are, you know, recognized in the the long-term approach is not just about where the people come from, but that that uh, production of 
of vaccines and therapeutics and, you know, needs to be um, somewhat more homogeneously spread than it is right now that's very, very clustered um, in resource-rich countries of the world. So, so um, I think we're on the right path, but uh, we still have a long ways to go. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Any other questions or comments to Professor Bausch? What you thought about after uh, participating in this seminar? Professor, thank you for the lecture. It was, it was very informative. This question is from the last seminar I wanted to ask you, but that the time was up, so I will ask you today. So last time you mentioned that the this uh, COVID-19 has no underlying immunity. So this means that this is not a natural natural virus? Uh, it's not a what virus? Natural, like uh, it is not the nat by nature. So what, what, what we know from other coronaviruses, so first of all, um, the, the family of coronaviridae, if you will, um, using the, the taxonomic term, um, is, a, is a family that prior to, not this outbreak, but to the 2003 SARS-CoV-1 outbreak in, in Southeast Asia that started in, in Southern China. Um, so prior to that, the, the coronaviruses that we knew, there wasn't much known. We knew various coronaviruses that um, were primarily animal pathogens that infected turkeys and chickens and pigs and, uh, and a few other things, a few other um, animals usually not with severe disease in animals, and, and a few known coronaviruses um, that infect humans and cause mild respiratory or mild um, gastroenteric disease. And so when SARS, uh, when SARS came in 2003, and ultimately um, that coronavirus, um, SARS-CoV-1, was identified, that, and if you look at a, a phylogram in, in terms of genetic sequence, it, it's completely separate from all those others that call, cause mild disease. Those other ones that cause mild disease, it's fairly well recognized that there um, is reinfection. So uh, infection, the first infection of those diseases or those um, other non-SARS non coronaviruses, um, there is reinfection and disease that can be caused. And so that's what we know coming into this. And then we had SARS-CoV-1 in 2003. SARS-CoV-1 was also um, the evidence points to introduce to, to humans um, through bats as the primary reservoir, perhaps through an intermediate animal reservoir. We can't know a very similar story, if you will, than, uh, than what we're seeing with COVID-19, although the virus is somewhat different. But nevertheless, those two SARS-CoV-1 and 2 viruses, they cluster completely separately from all the other coronaviruses that we know. And so what we know coming into it so what was the other coronaviruses, there's reinfection. SARS-CoV-1, we were ultimately quite successful in, uh, it was challenging, but successful in stopping that out outbreak. And we don't believe that that virus is circulating in humans anymore. We haven't seen any with the, once the outbreak um, that was, uh, was controlled, um, there were a few laboratory infections that occurred after that, that were, which were rapidly controlled without onward transmission. And so now that virus has not been seen in the world um, since 2004. And so we have no evidence whether there's reinfection with that virus or not, because it's not circulating in the wild. So those are the things that we have to go on so far, are, are the other coronaviruses, which are quite different genetically, and then SARS-CoV-1, which is somewhat similar genetically, but is not circulating in the, in the wild and in humans as far as we can tell right now. So then we, we look, what do we know from, uh, from those diseases we've had, uh, and from COVID-19, we've had a few um, reported cases of reinfections, um, very, very few, and it's really always hard to make conclusions from those very few cases. They may well be right, but you know, one always has to has to consider that there can be laboratory error and lots of different things going on. And that's not a, a fault of any investigator, but um, it just th these things happen uh, and they may be atypical. And then we, we look at what we know in terms of um, protection from the, the COVID-19 uh, COVID infections that we have so far. We see in many, but not all studies, evidence of um, waning antibody 
after months of, of uh, infection. We've seen recently some infection of not waning, but uh, maintain cell mediated immunity. And antibody is, uh, I, can't, I think we talked about this last time, antibody is not um, the only thing that's important to measure. So you can have waning antibody, but still have cell mediated immunity that is harder to measure, can be measured, but harder to measure. So I think we're still really up in the air about, uh, about reinfection. One would anticipate that um, initial infection will provide protection for some time, whether that's three, six months, 12 months, two years, we can't really say. And of course, we haven't even gotten a year into this COVID-19 outbreak. So even if we could go back and test all the first people who were infected, we still wouldn't know, you know, there's still not a year past their initial infection. Um, and, and then, uh, and then it's probably reasonable to suspect that secondary infections would perhaps be less severe than primary infections. So I don't think it's, um, I, I think it, it's something that we really don't know the answer to yet and how important it will be. As we discussed last week, you know, the vaccines and uh, reaching herd immunity through vaccination is one approach, but I think at least for the time being, um, it's not really a panacea. It's not something that's going to make everything right again or perfect again. We're going to have to really learn to deal with this virus in the ways that we, we do have evidence in terms of um, physical distancing and consistent mask wearing and, and, um, and hygiene, hand hygiene that can control the virus, but we need to do a much better job at it. And then additional very valuable tools that we hope will come online will of course be a vaccine if we can get to that. And as we discussed last week, uh, an effective and widely available and easy to give therapeutic would be a, a game changer if we were able to say, well, if you did get um, COVID-19, don't worry too much about it because we have a good therapy and so you won't die from it. So, but we're, we're still a ways away from those tools, not only in terms of scientifically the development of them, but also the challenges of production and distribution and equitable, equitable distribution around the globe. So, so we, we need to come back right now and, uh, and be focusing on those important elements, that, the, the stuff that's not the, not the exciting things and, and the, what should be the simple things, but apparently are harder for us to, to really act on in terms of masks and hand hygiene, hand hygiene and, and physical distancing. And if we can do that, we can also, uh, I know this is a long answer to your question, but if we can do that, we, um, we can get back to you know, some version of normal. It won't be normal, but we can get back to saying, okay, we can keep shops and, and restaurants and things open in a, in a different way, but, um, and we can keep our economy moving, certainly not in the way that it was before. So that, that really needs to be our, our short-term goal. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. I also want to ask one question. So in today's lecture, you uh, explained to us about the uh, UK Rapid Support Team. And I think it's a very unique and amazing uh, team that you have developed. You explained to us that not only deploying people in case of emergency, but uh, you also uh, do research and also uh, capacity building. And But uh, how did you come up with this uh, structure of the program and also how, what's the uh, view of uh, British government in uh, su supporting, maintaining this uh, project? Yeah. So the, the first question, um, how the, this was conceived, again, a, a little bit, how, as I discussed with Ebola, recognizing that, um, that it wasn't only about the response, but recognizing that the the research element that these are our only opportunities often to do research and, and that, that is challenging to do and one of the we, we recognize that prior to the existence of the rapid support team but one of the challenges has always been that you say okay well we don't have enough resources we, we have to focus now on stopping transmission and stopping the outbreak and so then when all that's over maybe we can think about research and that, while that makes sense, of course, what happens is when all of it's over, it's too late to do the research and you, you can't do the research because there's no more patients to enroll in a clinical trial and, and those sorts of things. And so one of the ways um, to get around that, we recognize that you, you need to have the resources to not have the research taking away from the response. 
And, uh, and one of the ways that you need to do that is if you rely on teams that are just put together in an ad hoc way. And so somebody who works for the government or works for a university and you say, okay, we're going to pull you in when we need you gets very difficult because they have their full-time job and other things to do. And, uh, and so you don't really don't have resources. You can maybe pull them in, but you don't have the resources to pull them in to do the outbreak response, but also to work on the research. And so <clears throat> we put together this program designed to really have people that um, work full-time for the rapid support team. They don't have other jobs. I mean, we, we do have the reservists, of course, but our core deployable team, this is what they do. They're, they're, we don't have to take them away from anything. So that does take resources. It's important to, to, uh, to commit the resources. And then we come to your second question, what does the, the government think of, of us and you know, what to, can we anticipate moving forward? Um, from you know all the the feedback that I get from ministers and from the the parliament uh, level in the UK, I, I think, and from the chief medical officer Chris Whitty and um, Sally Davies before him, and certainly from the London School, you know, I, I think we're well thought of and thought of as a as an important element um, in the UK and and the response and recognizing that. It's not only, as I've mentioned today, and I think last time, that it's, it's even if you don't think that it's particularly important to respond to outbreaks in low and middle income countries, it's also important that that's how you prevent the outbreak from coming home to the UK and, uh, and affecting the local population. So for both reasons, it's extremely important. Um, so I, I think, you know, in terms of how our team is viewed quite positively. Of course, I'm biased because I've been privileged to set it up and direct it. But um, but then the, you know there's the reality that I can't know and none of us can know. The the UK, as you if you follow the news, is um, one of the countries, of course, that has really very rapid COVID-19 transmission right now, and is um, unfortunately in a position to have a major economic impact of COVID-19. And so we'll just have to see. I don't think uh, I'd be highly surprised and from the information I get from, from the Department of Health and Social Care and, and higher levels in the government, I don't think our team is gonna get cut on what degree of you know, funding we'll get. Uh, you know, th there's quite frankly speaking also just the political part of this and you can imagine sort of the this isn't the reason to do things, but the the story and the and the daily news of cutting the team that works on pandemics in the middle of pandemic wouldn't look very good, right? We can all understand that, but I don't think that's the reason that we will continue to exist and continue to to be funded. I think it's because we recognize that this is an um, important work that needs to be done. Thank you so much. Yeah, I hope that your activity will continue. And I was also wanted to say that uh, other countries should follow your uh, model of uh, creating such a great team. Yeah, thank you. We, we actually do have um, various other countries that have now and, and prior to um, COVID-19 that have contacted us and, and been interested in come to meet with me in London and saying, you know, how would we put this together? And there's no one size fits all. I don't say that our model is perfect and everyone should do exactly as we do. And we're learning how to adapt and change as we move forward as well. But, um, but nevertheless, yeah, there is quite a, quite a bit of interest actually from other countries and, and how to also adopt similar strategies. Thank you so much. Yes. So, uh, any other questions? This is uh, last question. question. Yes, please, please. We, do we have time? This is um, probably something that was covered in the last session, which I'm sorry I didn't know about, but um, I was just interested quickly to hear about your thoughts on the impact of COVID-19 going forward on the response to the hemorrhagic fevers in low-income countries. Has there been... Um, you know, a, a massive redistribution of resources. Are these are these outbreaks going to become more neglected as a result of COVID nineteen? Well, it's not only a question of responding to other outbreaks. It's a, a equally and probably more importantly, or equally importantly, a question of responding to other endemic diseases, um, including non communicable diseases that, as we know, are, are a, a major cause of um, mortality and morbidity and in low and middle income countries as well. So we are seeing um, challenges and, and it's uh, of diverted resources where we say, okay, now everybody needs to be working on COVID-19, but 
and, and not only um, not only say, for example, is there enough capacity to respond to the ongoing, but hopefully almost over Ebola outbreak in the other side of, uh, of the Democratic Republic of the Congo in Equator province, which is probably somewhere around a week away from being able to declare that outbreak over if we have no new cases. But um, we, we were not able to provide as much support for that as we normally would. Fortunately, um, fortunately, there were very experienced Congolese investigators who could respond to it in an area where there had been outbreaks before, and also fortunately, in a way, in, in a very isolated area, so there wasn't a lot of um, contact and, and ability for that virus to move between areas and, and spread. But um, even, you know, equally importantly is just can we get the routine vaccinations into people to make sure that we don't have resurgence of which we're seeing around the world for other reasons and vaccine resistance and, and uh, as well. But, um, you know, do we have resurgence of, of measles and, and other things? Are, are we, do we have peaks of malaria, um, morbidity and mortality and uh, HIV care and things like that? And, and so unfortunately we have seen, and one of the things that we struggle with for COVID-19 and, and prior to COVID-19, you know, if you looked at the, uh, the large Ebola outbreak in West Africa, there, there were peaks in almost all the other non-target, if you will, diseases and, um, and lapses that occurred in people not getting, for example, their, their TB therapy or their HIV therapy. And so um, a, a very, very challenging environment. And so we're, we're trying to you know, recognize that, do a better job of recognizing that these days, but it's, it's challenging and, and also challenging just also in the logistics of fractured supply chains and just you know, flights to get products into countries. But um, I think there's, I won't say that it's not, it doesn't continue to be a, a huge problem, but there's um, more than there had been in, in future or in past years, a recognition that we need to really keep our eye on that ball as well and, and not, not let everything drop to the ground, but uh, limited limited resources, and then also um, challenged by, of course, the the many logistical impediments. Thank you so much, Professor Bausch. Uh, we wanted to ask uh, listen more about your stories, but uh, the time is uh, past, so uh, we would like to end this uh, short course. But uh, at the last, uh, can any of everyone uh, open your face and uh, thank uh, Professor Bausch? Thank you very much. Great, thank you all, all of you for, for joining today. A pleasure to speak with you. Good luck in your studies and careers. I'm, I'm sure I'll be in contact with some of you. Thank you so much. Uh, we uh, learned a lot from your lecture today and uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to see you again for future collaboration. Hope so. Bye-bye.